So if you ask me why I make YouTube videos, I'd probably say because it's fun and it helps people and it's some kind of creative outlet. But in reality, a big part of why I'm a YouTuber is because I secretly love the money, the fame, and the social status that it gives me. But those are the hidden motives, the ones that it's less socially acceptable to talk about. And those hidden motives are what Kevin Simler and Robin Hansen explore in their book, The Elephant in the Brain, which is the topic for this episode of Book Club, the series where we discuss the key insights and ideas from some of my favorite books. Drawing on neuroscience and evolutionary psychology, Kevin and Robin argue that we're all intrinsically selfish at heart, and crucially, we're often blind to our own true motives for doing stuff. So in this video, we're gonna look at firstly, what is the elephant in the brain and what's the main thesis? Secondly, why do we hide our own true motives from everyone else? And thirdly, we'll explore some of the different domains in which these true motives actually change the way society functions. You might have heard the phrase, the elephant in the room, which usually refers to something that is there, but that people are refusing to acknowledge. The elephant in the brain is similar in that it represents the hidden motives, the bits in our brain that we all kind of know are there, but we don't want to acknowledge. And the reason why it's the elephant in the brain rather than the mouse in the brain is because our hidden motives actually make up a big chunk of our behavior and we can even see them play out in the economic data for large institutions. Essentially, there's four parts to the general theory of the book. Firstly, people are judging us all the time. They wanna know whether we'd make good friends, allies, and leaders. And one of the most important things they're judging is our motives. Why do we behave the way that we do? Secondly, because other people are judging us, we're eager to look good. And because it's our motives that they're judging, we wanna emphasize our pretty motives and we wanna downplay our ugly motives. It's not exactly lying, but it's not exactly being fully honest either. Thirdly, this applies to our words, but often our own thoughts in that we're not always aware when we are falling into this trap. In a way, we deceive ourselves the better to deceive others. And fourthly, there are large scale societal consequences to the ways that our brains operate with these hidden motives. And when enough of these hidden motives harmonize, we end up creating institutions around them, things like medicine, politics, and religion. So that's the main thesis of the book. It's a, a very big book, so obviously we're just scratching the surface of it. But let's now look at some of the reasons why we've developed this thing where we have to hide our true motives. And essentially what the authors are arguing is that because we as humans are an inherently social animal, we've evolved in ways that mean we have to deceive ourselves and we have to deceive others to try and get the best for ourselves and for our groups. They look at animal behavior, competition, norms, cheating, self-deception, and what they call counterfeit reasons to illustrate how certain behaviors, actions, and reasons may appear altruistic on the surface, but they conceal hidden motives that we're often not even aware of ourselves. One interesting part is their argument about competition. And generally we've got this idea that humans have evolved big brains and all this kind of stuff that we do because it made us better adapted for our environment. But they make a pretty compelling case that actually, you know, the environmental adaptations drove evolution up to a point, but then it was the needs of social life, the need for us to outcompete our friends and our peers that actually supercharged the evolution of our brains. And there's a nice story that they use called the parable of the redwoods, uh, which illustrates this point. So redwood trees are famously very tall, but the weird thing about redwood trees is that like all of them, like they're all clustered in one place, but they're all like super, super, super tall. And like the next tree down is like, you know, nowhere near their height. And they talk about how when it comes to redwood trees, it's kind of inefficient for all of them to be kind of going as, as high as they possibly can. The point of a tree growing up is that it just needs to get sunlight. So it's very wasteful to grow excessively tall when the stuff that you're competing against is so small. And it would actually be a lot better for the redwoods to kind of focus on growing out wider because then they can get more leaves and get more sunlight that way. But the point is with redwoods is because they're surrounded by other redwood trees, they're all locked in this evolutionary arms race where they all have to grow as tall as possible. Otherwise, one of them is gonna outcompete the others. And so it's kind of the same with humans. Like they're arguing that the reason why our brains are so developed compared to the rest of our body and compared to the rest of the animal kingdom is because we're locked in this evolutionary arms race with the rest of our peers when it comes to the social domain. So this intra-species competition means that people who are selfish are gonna be rewarded in terms of natural selection. But crucially, they argue that we've developed social norms to try and keep people in their place. Like for obviously bad things like murder and theft and stuff, we have like actual laws against that. But for more subtle things that are bad, like, you know, cutting in front of someone in a queue, 
We don't want to have a law against that. And that's why we have social norms that govern that side of human behavior. For example, there is a subtle social norm against bragging. It's considered a generally bad thing to do, even though obviously it's not illegal. And on the one hand, we all have this natural aversion to people bragging or overly showing off. But on the other hand, we know that there's a subtle evolutionary incentive to show off as much as we can, because we need people to notice our good qualities and traits, and therefore they're more likely to become allies, friends, and romantic partners. And linked to this norm against bragging, we also have a social norm against self Selfish motives. Like if you ask someone why they want to be a doctor, it would be generally frowned upon for them to say, I want to be a doctor because it's a prestigious job. It makes lots of money and makes me feel good about myself. Whereas to say that, oh, you know, because I can help people and because, you know, I enjoy science and, and stuff, that's much more socially acceptable. Let's take me, for example, uh, a few months ago, I made a YouTube video entitled how much money I earn as a doctor and YouTuber in which I broke down different sources of passive income. And my official reason for making that video was A, because I wanted to get views, which is, you know, not a too bad a thing to, to admit. But secondly, because I wanted to inspire people who would see that this is an absurd amount of money and that would get started on their own journey of passive income. Those were the official reasons but taking <laughs> Kevin and Robin's theories into account about the elephant in the brain, there must have been a part of me that secretly got a kick out of bragging about how much money I make on the internet. And so on the surface, I have to talk about the altruistic motives for making that video, but then secretly, there's probably a selfish motive behind it as well, but don't tell anyone, that's just between you and me. And linked to this, we have this idea of counterfeit reasons. So there's a lovely quote from JP Morgan, which I've, I've been thinking about a lot, which is that a man always has two reasons for doing something, a good reason, and the real reason. And they argue that basically our brains can rationalize our behaviors in ways that we aren't even aware of. And they talk about a brain module that they call the press secretary, which is kind of like the president's press secretary, whose job it is to explain away the president's actions, like whatever they are, in a way that displays them in a good light. And so equally, our own brain's press secretary takes our inputs and all our different actions and will try and explain it in as altruistic and as like, non-selfish a way as possible. And what they're saying in the book is that often we don't even know when our press secretary is kind of twisting the facts because it's just such an intrinsic part of our nature. In fact, there's quite a nice study on split brain patients. So these are patients who've had a corpus callosomectomy, i.e. the left and the right hemispheres of their brains no longer can communicate with each other. And there's a funny example that they talk about where there was a subject who had some instructions flashed in their left eye which was then interpreted by the right hemisphere. And that instruction said, get up and leave the room. And so the right hemisphere processes the action of getting up and going to the room. And so when this guy got up, the researchers asked, what are you doing? And because language tends to be in the left hemisphere and the left and right hemispheres aren't talking, the guy knew that he was getting up, but didn't know why he was getting up. And so he said, oh, I got up to get a Coke. Obviously, you know, we can't extrapolate split brain studies to everyday life, but I think it's just like, it's an interesting illustration of how our brains are very capable of lying to ourselves and we don't often know the true motives behind what we're actually doing. So those were some of the points that they make. And basically in the first half of the book, they spend it kind of building up the case as to why evolutionarily we've developed this need to hide our true motives from other people. But then in the second half of the book, they talk about different ways, like practically speaking, where this manifests itself. The authors look at how our hidden motives can be seen at the individual level in body language, laughter, conversation, consumption, charity, and art. And also when enough of the hidden motives harmonize, they shape long lived institutions and systems, including medicine, education, religion, and politics. Let's take something like charity, for example. Now giving to charity is obviously a good thing, but when it comes to giving to charity, you know, the elephant in the brain, the hidden motive is the fact that we, we wanna to signal to other people how much money we have and how altruistic and charity giving that we are. For example, they talk about how only a tiny proportion of all donations to charity are anonymous, which shows that we all kind of wanna have our name associated with the fact that we're giving to charity. And they talk about how super rich people go to all these like charity galas and events and auctions. And in these contexts, like stupidly large amounts of money get pledged or donated to charity but in a way that everyone else can see what's going on. And so while obviously this is good because charities are making lots of money, it's also a way for rich people to signal to other rich people and celebrities how rich and how altruistic they are. The other interesting part of the charity thing is that real world altruism is very, very different to effective altruism. For example, if you set up a regular monthly donation to the Against Malaria Foundation, which is one of the most cost-effective charities in the world, you can literally save a handful of lives over the course of a standard career. But setting an automatic monthly donation feels a lot less good than giving 10 or 20 pounds to the people on the streets that collect for Save the Children or Help for Heroes every now and then, even though we probably know that most of that donation is probably going to administrative overheads because lots of these charities aren't very cost effective. And here's a nice quote from the book that explains why this happens. Think about it. Which kind of people are likely to make better friends, co-workers and spouses? 
Is it the calculators who manage their generosity with a spreadsheet? Or is it the emotors who simply can't help being moved to help people right in front of them? Sensing that emotors rather than calculators are generally preferred as allies, our brains are keen to advertise that we are emotors. They go on to say that the perverse conclusion is that the forms of charity that are most effective at helping others aren't the most effective at helping donors signal their good traits. And when push comes to shove, donors will often choose to help themselves. And again, we're just scratching the surface of what they talk about in the book because this is a huge book and we can't summarize it in a small YouTube video. Um, but then they go on to talk about how a few different institutions are shaped by this whole hidden motive thing. Let's take religion, for example. And as we know, with basically all organized religions, there is a large aspect of the social community vibe associated with it. But what they argue in the book is that people aren't getting together because they have a common belief. They are getting together because that is required socially and they're essentially making up this common belief as a way of explaining why they're all getting together. There's a quote which is that, we don't worship simply because we believe, instead we worship and believe because it helps us as social creatures. Then we've got things like politics where there's lots of different weird behaviors that we as voters fall into. For example, as voters, we tend not to really care about the specific policies that we're voting for and instead we focus more on what party our tribe is voting for. We couldn't care less what the actual record is of the congressman or the member of parliament that we're voting for. In fact, often we might not even know who they are. We might just know that they're part of the Labour Party or part of the Democrat Party. And all these behaviors are kind of weird, right? Because if we actually cared about how our country was being governed, we wouldn't fall into these like destructive patterns of thinking. And so what the authors argue is that when it comes to things like politics, it's a lot more about social signaling and about loyalty to our tribe than it is about actually caring about the individual policies that are, that are gonna govern the nation. And so having spent most of the book arguing the somewhat depressing idea that we're all fairly selfish creatures and we care more about signaling to our friends than actually doing good, they end by talking about some of the ways we can use this knowledge of the elephant in the brain to help improve ourselves as people and to help make a better society. Firstly, if we understand the selfish and social reasons as to why humans behave, that helps us as individuals be more situationally aware. Secondly, the main point in the book isn't that, hey, look at these other people, they're all selfish. It's more that we actually were blind to our own true motives. And so next time we find ourselves feeling indignation or self-righteousness at something obviously wrong that someone else is doing, we should take a step back, have a look in the mirror and see whether those behaviors are actually manifesting in ourselves. And like for me, when I was reading this, I really felt like my mind expanding and I was, you know, I find myself seeing different aspects of the world in completely different ways. And another realm in which I have that kind of mind broadening experience is when I do an online course over at Brilliant who are very kindly sponsoring this video. If you haven't heard, Brilliant is a platform with incredible online courses in maths, science, and computer science that really help you understand concepts intuitively rather than the kind of rote memorization that a lot of schoolwork is based around. One of their new courses is about knowledge and uncertainty, which like all of their courses is super engaging and interactive. And it teaches us things like information theory, Bayesian networks and causal inference, but in an accessible way rather than with like big heavy calculations getting in the way. Much like the elephant in the brain gives us the tools for thinking about interpersonal issues in our lives, a course like this one teaches us how we can think in a different way in an uncertain world. If you'd like to join me alongside this journey of expanding our minds and learning cool stuff, then head over to brilliant.org forward slash Ali and the first 200 people to hit that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. And if you do, you can then signal your newfound intellect to your friends, which Kevin and Robin would then be immensely proud of. If you like this video, then definitely check out the book. It's very good, it's very engaging. Even though it's quite long, it just, you know, you know I got through it pretty quickly. Um, and here is a playlist of some of the other videos in my book club series, where we summarize the key insights and ideas from some of my favorite books. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to smash that like button and hit the subscribe button if you aren't already. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.